Hello, and thank you for joining us on this week's edition of Northwest Newsweek. I'm Catalina Gillies. Ontario Provincial Police have begun their reinvestigation of the 2015 death of Stacey DeBungie. The OPP's involvement was requested by Ontario's Ministry of the Attorney General back in June, after an independent review found city police had failed to properly investigate. OPP officers gathered environmental evidence like river temperature and depth Tuesday at the site where Devungi's body was found exactly six years ago. Detective Inspector Sean Glassford says provincial police will dedicate whatever time and resources it takes to ensure a thorough investigation. You know, six years later, uh, there is, uh, you know, there, there, there are difficulties to that, obviously. Uh, people's memories fade and whatnot, but we're going to be... Uh, we're going to be reinvestigating. We're going to be talking to people. Uh, we've set up a tip line that we want people to call in with any tips that they may have. Each one will be uh, followed up and um, slow and meticulous. There are people in the community that, that have uh, knowledge, I have no doubt, and we'd like to speak with them. Uh, six years later, I, I think the community deserves to know what happened to Stacy and as well as his family. The OPP will have access to files from the original investigation by Thunder Bay Police. Ontario's independent police watchdog found in 2018 that the local police force had ignored important leads and may have been influenced by anti-Indigenous racism. Three investigating officers face disciplinary hearings over that process next year. Glassford says the OPP plans to re-interview witnesses from that investigation and speak with new ones. Anyone with information is urged to contact a special tip line at 1-833-533-8477. Information can also be submitted to Crime Stoppers for those who wish to remain anonymous. The Ministry of Labor is investigating a workplace death involving a logging operator. A 56-year-old man working in the bush around 60 kilometers north of Wraith received fatal injuries following an incident involving his logging truck. The critical injury was reported to Ministry Thursday and an inspector attended the scene. The employer BTG Contracting, based out of Gorham Township, has been issued nine requirements as a result. The investigation is ongoing. Veteran Liberal MPP Michael Gravel is apologizing and hoping for forgiveness after going against his party's platform which favors vaccine mandates in the healthcare field. Gravel recently wrote a letter to the Ford government requesting advice for an accommodation to be made for an unvaccinated healthcare worker in Terrace Bay. Gravel sent this email to both the Minister of Health and the Minister of Long-Term Care after one of his constituents, a PSW working at Wilkes Terrace, was facing potential job loss due to being unvaccinated. The email went public and Gravel says he now realizes he was wrong and deeply regrets sending it. I felt by asking for advice from the government on what accommodations might be available was not inappropriate at the time I wrote it. Upon reflection, I now realize that uh, very much went against what our clear party policy is, again, a policy that I strongly support. So uh, uh, again, a misjudgment. I'm, I've uh, made mistakes in the past. I suspect I may in the future, but I'm uh, again going to always try and uh, I give good thought to what I do, and in this case, it was the wrong one, and I, again, I apologize for that. Gravel says he doesn't know how the email he sent was made public, but CTV is reporting that it was given to journalists at Queen's Park by Health Minister Christine Elliott's press secretary. Gravel says he wants people to know that he is owning this mistake and is sorry to anyone he may have offended. The district's medical officer of health is reminding locals that loosening restrictions at events doesn't mean other safety measures have changed. Dr. Janet DeMille is also listening intently to the province's chief medical officer of health, who has hinted to moving to a more regional-based plan to manage COVID-19. Corey Nordstrom has the details. Capacity changes for some venues may seem like things are getting back to normal, but the district's medical officer of health wants residents to remain cautious. They have received calls from organizers and the public about individuals not wearing masks or violating other pandemic rules, but none so serious that she had to get involved. We are not seeing spread at those events at this time, uh, but our COVID rates are really, really low at the, at the present time. 
And I think, uh, you know, it's going to be watched very carefully at the provincial level in terms of whether there is spread uh, and how significant that spread is at these events. Chief Medical Officer of Health Kieran Moore has stated his desire for more regional restrictions rather than province-wide. We've struggled with that here before because we've had low case rates when um, some places, especially down in southern Ontario, haven't. And then we've been, you know, perhaps had more stricter public health restrictions imposed here because of a provincial approach. And I certainly am supportive of looking at regional options. DeMille is also feeling hopeful after the federal government secured 2.9 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, specifically for children aged 5 to 11. Health Canada has yet to approve the batch made specifically for that age group, but the health unit is preparing to start immunizations towards the end of November or early December if that approval comes. DeMille has also heard of some other good news on that vaccine front. Probably won't be experiencing supply issues around the pediatric formulation. That, uh, Like the same way we saw earlier this year with the adult formulation, it was a little bit slow in coming. Uh, it does appear that that won't be the case. Corey Nordstrom, TBT News. While some hospitals and health centers have implemented vaccine mandates, which require all employees to be vaccinated or face the termination of employment, the Dryden Regional Health Centre has opted to an alternative solution. The facility has implemented a vaccine policy which requires staff to either be fully vaccinated or undergo a rapid antigen test every 72 hours. DRHC officials say 91% of staff are fully vaccinated, with the remaining 9%, which roughly represents 20 to 30 employees, are either between first and second doses or are not getting vaccinated altogether. CEO Doreen Armstrong Ross says some people are not getting vaccinated due to medical reasons, and while the hospital wants a high number of staff vaccinated, she understands a certain reality of the situation which existed prior to COVID. We in healthcare, in <clears throat> certainly in Dryden, but in all of uh, Ontario and really the world, there's a shortage of healthcare providers and we want to ensure that we can offer the services we need to our patients safely. So we did take the more aggressive approach to every 72 hour testing of our unvaccinated or in between vaccinated staff. Armstrong Ross says in addition to vaccinations, the hospital is putting an emphasis on proper PPE usage, physical distancing and having appropriate room size to people ratios. It appears residents of Terrace Bay will be unable to skate this year following an equipment failure to the town arena. The decision to cancel arena ice this year was made during Monday's council meeting, spurring a lot of discussion and varying opinions on how to proceed. Adam Riley has the details. Aging infrastructure is the cause of issues at the Terrace Bay Arena this season. In his report to Council Monday, Treasurer Dan Mulligan says a replacement of all three brine pumps was needed. But now mechanical issues have stymied the ability to install arena ice this year altogether. During the startup of the ice plant, the 16 horsepower arena pump seized. This is the only pump that has the capacity to install the arena ice. Due to the age of the pump, replacement parts are, parts are obsolete. Further compounding the issues is the fact that the concrete pad upon which all three pumps sit has begun to crack and crumble. I don't know if any of you guys went and had a look, but Lara brought me <coughs> and showed me that the base is bad um, to the point that I can't believe we were jamming screwdrivers underneath it to stop the vibration. It's those factors that led to Mulligan recommending to Council that the arena ice be cancelled for the 2021 season and that curling ice be the only ice installed this year. A recommendation that didn't sit well with some members of council. Minor hockey numbers are increasing around here. There are people that use the ice beside minor hockey, figure skating, public skating, stuff like that. And I think the, the arena is part of the community. And you get rid of that ice. When we don't put ice in this year, I think the minor hockey numbers will suffer. Uh, people just lose interest. Council also had the option of finding a replacement pump to install the arena ice. However, it was estimated that plan could take up to 8 to 10 weeks, and due to the state of the concrete pad, the vibrations would damage the replacement pump. Eventually, Council voted 3 to 2 in favour of only operating the curling rink. However, Mayor Jody Davis says they are going to look for a temporary solution for the arena, 
one he believes is feasible. Can we isolate the pumps totally from uh, this, the brain system so we can do work on that pump? Because some people in the mill, we have, you know, we're a small town, a lot of people work in the mill, we have a lot of tradesmen in the mill, feel that there might be some older pumps in the mill that may be able to rehabilitate our failed pump and maybe get us going again. Barring that, Davis says he has spoken with officials from nearby Scriber who are willing to provide extra ice time in their arena for Terrace Bay residents. Adam Riley, TBT News. And when we come back, officials with the East-West Tie, a project being built along the North Shore, shares an update on passing a project milestone. It's been a very long journey, but the finish line is in sight for the East-West High Transmission Project. The new power line corridor stretches from Shunia along the north shore of Lake Superior all the way to Wawa. Adam Riley has the latest on the project, which has given a $777 million economic booster shot to the region. Nextbridge's East-West High spent years in development, was almost outbid by Hydro One, spurred skilled jobs training in many communities, and is now less than six months away from becoming operational. Project Director Jennifer Tidmarsh says the end is in sight, especially after hitting an important milestone earlier this week. We finished all of our foundations. So um, first step was clearing, and we finished all of our clearing. Uh, the next step um, was getting all our access roads in, and now we've actually finished all of the bases for all of the towers. And over the next little while, really what's left is us doing... Um, uh, uh, like the um, putting the towers up and then also stringing. A total of 1,228 towers will make up the line and almost 1,000 have been completed. Tidmarsh notes there were some delays on the project. Prior to COVID, a strike at the Port of Montreal stalled the delivery of parts. Then some of the work camps dealt with COVID-19 outbreaks, followed by an unexpected delay this summer. There were the fires uh, this summer. So we were, because of... Um, MNRF orders, we were uh, ceased construction on certain work fronts for about a month. However, we've made up time. While much of the project is taking place deep in the bush, some aspects of it can be seen along the highway, including these spires that appeared above a rock cut along Highway 1117, northeast of Thunder Bay. Tidmarsh says they are of a unique tower design for the project and serve a special purpose. That set of towers actually has to go above um, an existing, the existing 230 KV line. So the way that they've been engineered 
is originally you would have in the old days you would have had to build a tower that was twice that high but with this engineering today we can actually take those six poles and they don't have to be that high so that we don't have to use the extra steel and so that it's much more stable. Much of the work is now being moved to the eastern region with some tower construction and line stringing being left to be completed in the west. By the end of the year it's expected both the camps in White River and the Lake Helen First Nation will be closed while the ones in Marathon and Wawa will continue to operate as they are hubs for the project. The East-West High is slated to be powered up in March of next year. Adam Riley, TBT News. For more than a century, the pulp mill in Dryden has been the economic driver for the community. But many workers associated with the construction project built between 2002 and 2004 at the mill claim it put them at unnecessary risk. Molly Thomas investigates why workers and their families believe they were smoked. Every morning, Diane Corvo wakes up in disgust, seeing this 108-year-old paper mill right behind her home. I wish that it had burned down. I wish it had be destroyed. I hate that mill. Diane's partner, Brian, died in 2012. He was a steel worker at the mill for a massive construction project to keep toxic and smelly fumes out of Dryden. He said it had to be one of the worst times in his life to be on a job. This home video shot by a worker shows the smoke people on the project were exposed to. Here it's blowing away from the workers. The problem was when it blew towards them. So what happened when Brian started to work at Dryden? What did you notice? Everything about him changed. He started getting wobbly, shaky, not able to sleep. In 2004, the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers set up an intake clinic. They found more than half of the workers reported fatigue. Almost 200 experienced memory loss and dozens had problems sleeping and mood swings. What jumped out immediately was changes to their functioning as people, their memory, they weren't as sharp. Dr. Karen diagnosed 162 workers with CTE, chronic toxic encephalopathy, a toxic brain injury caused by repeated exposure to chemicals. Ontario's Workplace Safety and Insurance Board rejected the CTE diagnosis, claiming there is no evidence of exposure to significant levels of chemicals to warrant a link. But they did give out money to more than 200 workers for short-term symptoms like respiratory problems. Small solace for Diane, who didn't get a dime and has given up on fighting for compensation. Molly Thomas, CTV News, Toronto. The MPP for Kiewetanung is calling on the Ford government for more mental health supports after the latest rash of suicides on First Nations. Saul Mamakwa says since 1986, there have been 562 suicides in remote communities in his riding, which is many times higher than the provincial and national figures per capita. This year we've had multiple youth die by suicide in Yabmatun, Webekwe, Wanaman Lake, Poplar Hill First Nations. The mental health crisis that exists across the far northern Ontario is not letting up, Mr. Speaker. What is Ontario doing to ensure our youth have the mental health supports that they need? We know that we are losing far too many young people in particular from suicide as a result of their um, mental health concerns and some addiction concerns, and that this is particularly critical in many First Nation communities. That's why we have uh, pledged and are investing over $3.8 billion in additional funding for mental health and addiction services over the next 10 years. This is the federal funds that have been matched by the uh, provincial funds, and that we are particularly concentrating on First Nations communities. Red Rock has been a hub of activity for the past two years, which with much of the work centering on the town's new sewage treatment plant. Then late last year, the community embarked upon a plan to increase housing in Red Rock with the creation of a new subdivision. Adam Riley has an update on both of those projects. 
it was quite a project overtaken many a years. Um, and yeah, the, the, the plant, I mean, if, if you want to say a, a sewer plant is, is beautiful, this one certainly is. It has been a long journey, but the new $25 million sewage treatment plant in Red Rock is now complete, bringing to a close a hard-fought push to replace the former sewage treatment plant, which had served the community for the last 50 years. Town officials lobbied for years for funding, and eventually the project broke ground in May of 2019. Chief Administrative Officer Mark Figliamini says due to some delays related to COVID, some non-critical elements of the project are still left to be completed. You're going to see uh, that that whole site transformed uh, very soon. Um, we were hoping the end of this year um, for a lot of the, the cosmetic parts and, uh, and that, and it still may happen, but uh, as, as we get closer and closer and, and Mother Nature creeps in on us here with, uh, with some weather that, uh, that might bring, uh, bring snow and sleet and that kind of thing, that, uh, that we may see some of those, uh, those features stretched over into the spring. Figliamini says the old plant is expected to be demolished over the next week and is happy to announce that despite those delays, the project has fallen well within its budget. And as that project wraps, another which was initiated a year ago has hit a snag of sorts. Last October, the community embarked on a plan to convert a section of land along the lake into a waterfront subdivision. However, surveys have now shown that some of the land in question is owned by CN Rail, despite the fact the company has had no real North Shore operations for over a decade. Figliamini says despite that, council, along with Bruno's contracting, is still interested in pursuing the project. We're very optimistic that uh, that we can acquire that land and, and hopefully build the project that uh, was projected for that property. Um, and, and if not, and, and, and that's a big if not, um, we, we can readjust and restructure from there. Discussions with CN are expected to begin soon, according to Figliamini, as the property in question is essential to the project as it is designed now. Adam Riley, TBT News. And coming up after the break, Kuwetanung MPP Sol Mamakwa fights for free mentor projects in First Nation schools. Earlier this month, Ontario announced that it struck a deal with Shoppers Drug Mart to provide free menstrual products in schools across the province. But First Nation schools like Dennis Franklin Cromarty and the Matawa Education Centre here in Thunder Bay are federally funded and aren't included. 
On Wednesday at Queen's Park, Kiwetanung MPP Solmamakwa asked Ontario Education Minister Stephen Lecce point blank whether or not First Nations schools will be given access to those products, but he didn't provide a direct answer. Fortunate that the public private sector agreement did not see the need to address the issue for all students in Ontario, but only for those who attend provincial schools. I, may, I am asking, Speaker, for a clarification. As First Nations, schools in the riding have reached out and they, they asked if they can participate. Is the minister saying, is the minister telling me the program is not for First Nations schools? There was inaction by governments to date, and it was our government who made a decision to help uh, end period poverty in this province uh, and the advice of many student leaders, including the Ontario Student Trustees Association, who counseled us to find a fix to this problem. So we, over the last year, negotiated with Shoppers Drug Mart to deliver 18 million pads over three years, 1,200 dispensaries to, first, uh, to, uh, public, to publicly funded schools in the province of Ontario to support all students. Mamakwa says he has no plans to lobby the federal government at this time to implement a similar program for First Nations schools. He says since Shoppers is footing the bill for the free menstrual products in Ontario, but not the provincial government, First Nations schools should be given access even though they aren't provincially funded. And that wraps up this week's edition of Northwest Newsweek. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.